Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Today, we are switching gears a little bit, and we are talking about something that is not directly related to AI, but tangentially related to AI. And um, so we're talking about hash functions and hash tables. They are very, very important, um, not only in computer science in general, but in AI. We can use them for lots of many interesting things. And uh, you can use them on assignment two for an optimization if you want. You can use them for on assignment three if you really want to hardcore optimize assignment three as well. And of course, they will also be um, on the midterm. So let's jump right into it and talk about hash tables. Oh, one second. I forgot uh, to bring up the chat, just in case there are any questions. So give me one second to bring that up. If you, uh, somewhere out there in the chat, someone asked for a Discord invite, please send me an email so I can confirm that you are a student and I will reply with, uh, with a Discord link. All right, perfect. So let's get back to this. Here we go. Cool. So lecture seven, uh, hash functions and hash tables. What's all that about? So what is a hash function? A hash function is used to map data or transform data of an arbitrary size into a fixed size. So for example, take this string, whether it is a name or an address or some other form of text, and turn that somehow into an integer for me. That may have uses, uh, we'll see. Values returned by a hash function are called, are called hash values, hash sums, or simply just hashes. So you may see it different, referred to differently online. Hash values are commonly used as an index into a lookup table called a hash table. And so that's what a hash table is. We'll get back into hash tables later on in this lecture, but just realize that one of the uses for a function, um, or for a hash function, is to produce an index into a hash table. So here's an example of uh, a hash function which takes input data, um, this is string data, could be any data, and turns it into some integer number. Uh, for example, here, uh, I believe we have the, this is an example of the CRC32 hash function, which takes data and turns it into a 32-bit integer, okay? So um, these functions take in data, produce some integer. What is inside the hash function? Well, we'll see. What are some common uses of hash functions before we get into the details of how they're actually implemented? One is data retrieval. So we can use hash functions to quickly find data by computing and computing an index or a key to a hash table. Uh, for example, picture like a phone book, right? If we want to store someone's data, uh, maybe their address, their phone number inside a, in memory and be able to quickly retrieve that data, we could use something like a hash table. Data protection. For example, um, instead of storing a password in plain text, we could store a password hash so that the original password could not be retrieved. So if you're making a website um, or any sort of secure system and you have a password, right? You want your user to store a password. At some point, you're going to, be able, you're going to want to be able to compare what the user typed in for their password and what you have stored. So if you just stored a database of passwords, like the actual plain text passwords themselves, then if a hacker broke into your system, um, they would be able to steal the passwords and then log into someone's email address, for example. However, if you use a secure hash function to turn a password into, for example, an integer, then when someone goes to log into your system, instead of comparing what they type in directly to a stored password, you hash what they typed in and then compare that hash to what you have stored, which is a hash of the password. And so in that way, nobody ever sees what the real password is and you're still reasonably certain that what they typed in was the correct password. 
data verification. So um, this can also be a problem. Think about this problem. If I send you 10 gigabytes of data over the internet, how could I be absolutely certain that the 10 gigabytes of data that I sent are the exact same 10 gigabytes of data that you received? So that's, a, that's an important problem if you're sending very sensitive data. And if you think about it, there may not at first, well, okay, maybe you could send it twice and then compare the two pieces of data. But when you start to get into larger and larger amounts of data, then this is very problematic, right? You can't just send two copies of all the data. And so what you can do is you can take some very, very large data and you can run a, a hash function over it. Usually it's called a checksum. And this will produce a unique integer number, however big, a 32, 64, 256 bits, whatever. And so what you can do is you can send the data itself and the checksum value. And then after you've received the data, you could run the checksum program on the data to see if you got the same value. And so oftentimes this is what, um, uh, in places where you want to transfer a file and you want that transfer to be verified, they will provide the data itself and a checksum that you can actually use to do that. Also, another use um, is called geometric hashing. So it can be used for many proximity-based problems in, in computational geometry. Uh, before neural networks, it was used a lot in representing like uh, game board states and stuff like that. So geometric hashing could also have uses. And these are just some of the uses for hash functions. Um, someone said CRC error checking. So we're not getting into, there are like things like uh, error correcting codes and stuff like that. Um, this is specifically just for like exactly what I said. So you take a hash of data and you can compare your hash of the data to the hash that they said it should be and then verify the data. Container membership query. So in our course, for example, um, one of the most common things that we're going to be doing is open and closed list membership queries. So for example, is this thing in the closed list is one of the most common um, queries that we're going to be doing, for example, in a star search. And so how you store the open and closed list is going to matter when it comes to membership query. So some common structures that you could use, um, if you want to store the closed list as a list, then you would have big O of N membership query, right? You would have to search everything. If you have a set or a dictionary, maybe you have big O of log N. So you have log N instead of N, that's a lot better. Um, maybe you could have like a hash table where again, you could have O of N worst case lookup time, but as we will see, it's oftentimes much better than that. Or if we could somehow have a perfect hash table, then we could um, store and retrieve data into the hash table in constant time rather than uh, in N or log N time, which would be ideal. And so I'll get back into that um, a bit later. So hash tables. So to hash a data structure, so some amount of data means to represent it in another format. And that other format is typically a fixed size format or a simpler format. And so typically hashing is done by a function that turns data into another form of data. And the output of a hash function, typically you, you have an integer, some, some number as a hash function. Um, and the reasons for that is because, well, just some of the reasons are that computers store and handle integers very, very efficiently. We're not worried about any sort of rounding error or anything like that, like we might be for floats or doubles. Um, they can be manipulated efficiency, efficiently in many ways. So if we want to add, subtract, multiply, divide, all that kind of stuff is very uh, efficiently done with integers. And also because an integer could be directly translated into the index of an array, and if you can do that, then you have a hash table. So we'll get back into hash tables um, in a little bit. Let's talk about inputs and outputs. So your hash, your hash function typically is going to expect data in a specific format, right? Sometimes you could say, okay, just pass me an arbitrary stream of bytes. But usually a hash function is going to expect, um, for example, this might be uh, an integer value between one and a million or it might be a string which has length less than a thousand or something like that. So typically your hash function is going to expect a particular type of input. And then 
Your hash function may also expect a given range of values from a particular input format. So like I just said, a particular, a particular length of string, an amount of data, a range of integer value, etc. So if you have a hash function that expects some sort of input format and you give it data that is outside of that input format or that input range, you may have like, you may have results that are just not expected or not usable. So for example, if I expected to hash a string into an integer, but the data I gave it, I gave it wasn't a string, then I may not have like, um, I may have some undefined results. Like I'm not sure that I can use this data. It may not be secure, etc. So just make sure that you are passing in the data that you expect with this particular hash function. When it comes to the output of your hash function, typically hash functions produce values in a predefined format and range. So for example, this hash function will produce an integer um, between zero and, well, maybe if it's a 32-bit integer between zero and like four and a half billion or whatever that range is. Or maybe it produces between uh, 12 and 60. It can be whatever range that you want. Range is very, very important for the output of a hash function because it's often used as the index for your lookup table or your, or your array. And integers are very convenient because we can translate integers almost directly into indices for our hash table. And we can do so with the modulus operator um, to control the output range, which is, which is really easy to do. And I'll show an example of that a bit later. Hash functions also have many properties that, are, that make for very good exam questions. Okay, wink, wink. All right, so determinism. So this means whether or not it's deterministic or it contains some randomness. So a good hash function should not be random so that it always produces the same value for any given output. I cannot imagine a scenario where you would want to have a randomized hash function, right? It, why would you want to produce different values? The whole thing about hashing is that you can get back to the value that you had before. Uniformity. So uniformity is important because a good hash function maps inputs as evenly as possible to the output range in order to help prevent expensive hash collisions. I'll have a whole thing about hash collisions in a little bit, but basically we want to make sure that like, um, if we can somehow visualize all of our possible inputs and all of our possible outputs, that the amount of inputs that get mapped to specific outputs, it's uniformly distributed so that we don't have specific ranges of the output that have more value, more um, hashed values than other ranges of the output. Now, of course, there may be a specific functionality um, where you want to have non-uniform things, but for the vast majority of hash functions, and especially what we'll be talking about, you do want uniformity. Um, Someone just asked a question, which I will answer shortly in the slides, so I won't answer that right now. Output range. Oftentimes, it is desirable to have a defined output range for your hash function, um, as well as some sort of like fixed width, right? So for example, um, if you want to produce a integer value, oftentimes it's good to have that, you know, okay, it'll be uh, zero at minimum and like 32 bits, like 4 billion or whatever at maximum. And so that way we could use that integer for whatever, um, whatever index or whatever purpose we have later. So it's very desirable to have a very fixed range or a, we call that a fixed width sometimes. Data normalization. Sometimes the input data contains features that are kind of irrelevant, such as upper and lower case letters. So if you think about it, English capitalization is sort of, I don't know, its it makes things look good, I guess. We are used to it, but it's absolutely unnecessary. So for example here, um, this sentence, if I were to hash this sentence, I wouldn't care whether or not some things are, are uppercase or not, but for a password, I might. Right? I would want to have the, the ability to go upper or lowercase in a password, but if I'm just storing someone's name, then I don't need to care about the upper or lowercase letters. So sometimes we want to say hash away that those sort of features, and sometimes we want to keep those sort of features. Continuity. This is very interesting and very important. 
So this means that if a hash function is continuous, it means that if I change the input by a very small amount, so my inputs are similar, if it's continuous, then it means that my output would also be quite similar. So if I took the name Dave and I hashed it, and then instead of D-A-V-E, I said D-A-V-D, then those two hash outputs would be very similar. However, if it wasn't continuous, then you would not want them to be similar. So sometimes if we're doing, say, something in computational geometry and we want to hash two things that are very similar, maybe we do want our output to be similar if our inputs are similar. But a lot of the time, and in fact, most of the time, especially in things like cryptography, where we're we want to be very secure, if we have minor changes in the input, we want that to produce completely different values in the output. So if I had a password that I wanted to hash, and that password was, say, 32 characters long, if I changed even one of those characters, I would want the output of those two hashes to look nothing alike. Because if they looked a little bit similar, then you would be able to do some, you know, reverse engineering and possibly crack some passwords based on that. So sometimes we do want our hash functions to be continuous and sometimes we don't want them to be continuous. This next one is what the person in chat just asked about and it's reversibility. So some hash functions can be, can be reversible or invertible. So we can obtain the input back from a given output. So again, sometimes we might desire that. So if we could think um, in terms of geometry or in terms of our assignment, where say we want to map a specific location to an integer, right? Let's say we take an X, Y state in our environment and we want to map that to an integer for a hash table. We would want not only to get from that X, Y to the integer, but from the integer back to the X, Y location, right? So sometimes that's desirable, but in, in secure places like in passwords or cryptography, we would absolutely not want someone to be able to get back. Right? So if we took a password and hashed it into a hash value, we would not want that to be reversible. We would not want people to obtain the password from the, the hashes. So non-invertible functions are sometimes also called one-way hash functions. And the reason typically that they are one way is because there are far more possible input values than there are output values. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Different types of hash function algorithms. So the very first type of hash function algorithm is what I would call a trivial hash function. So that's when typically small data can be directly translated into a hash value. So for example, if I take um, an ASCII character, right? So the letter C and map it into an integer. Well, it's already stored in your computer as an integer. So all you would have to do is maybe subtract something from it or I could say, uh, turn a letter of the alphabet into an integer. So A would be zero, B would be one, C would be two, right? You, you can see what I'm going with there. So these are called trivial hash functions because there's almost nothing um, to, to the translation. Like they're very, very simple. There's another type of hash function called a perfect hash function. And perfect hash functions, um, they have the following property where each possible input maps uniquely to one value in the output range. And this is called a one-to-one -one function. So again, um, in the case where I want to map an integer, or sorry, uh, a letter of the alphabet into an integer, well, I could say, all right, well, I'm mapping letters. So there's 26 letters. So the output range is going to be 26 integers and I am uniquely mapping each of those 26 letters into one of the 26 integers. And so that would be a perfect hash function. And these are called one-to-one -one functions as well. Some more function properties, injective. So injective, and I'll give a diagram of this. I think it's much more intuitive from the diagram rather than from the description. So in an injective function, each input maps uniquely to an output. This means that some output values may be unmapped and many injective functions can be made invertible. So injective, when it says some values may be unmapped, 
Think if I was mapping all of the letters of the alphabet into an integer between 0 and 100. Well, there's only 26 letters, right? Each of those letters maps uniquely to an integer, but there are a bunch of integers left over. So injective does not guarantee that all of the output range is used, but it does guarantee that all of the input range is used. So there's injective, there's also surjective. It's kind of the opposite. So for every output value y, there is at least one input value x such that f of x equals y. At least one, but there may be multiple. So many surjective functions are not invertible. Because if I take that same property of mapping, uh, let's say I want to map a letter of the alphabet into an integer, but if my input range was 10, right? So yeah, each of those integers is going to be associated with an input value, but I can't get back to the letter from the output value because there's only 10 output values and I'm not sure which one it came from. Then there's bijective, and in a bijective function, the inputs and outputs map uniquely, okay? So, for, so from math, this, this was, if you have a function which is one-to-one -one and onto, this is a bijective function. And a bijective hash function is also called a minimal perfect hash function. It's a perfect hash function because it fits the definition of a perfect hash function. And because all of the inputs map uniquely to all of the outputs, then it's minimal. There's nothing wasted on either side. So if we look at these, um, these values, sorry, these properties graphically instead of their definitions, we can get a little bit more intuition for this. So here's an example of an injective function, right? So for this range of x values, if we plot the function, so this curve is the function, and this is often, you probably uh, remember this from like high school, it's called the horizontal line test. So if you plot your function, and then you draw a horizontal line, you ask yourself the question, does, the, does every possible horizontal line touch exactly one value? Okay, so if it's injective, then it will only touch at most one value. If it touches more than one value, then it's not injective, okay? So injective says each input maps uniquely to an output, but here we have three different x values that map to the same y value, so they are not mapped uniquely to the outputs. If we talk about something like a hash table, and we'll, we'll get into this again later, um, we may have two different values. So here, for example, John Smith and Sandra D. Both of the, the hash function may take John Smith and Sandra D and assign them the same hash value. And so that would not be injective either. Here is a uh, diagram blatantly stolen from Wikipedia that I would recommend memorizing for an exam because you may be asked to draw one of these things. So over here, we have an injective function, which is not surjective. So it's injective because each of the inputs map uniquely to an output, but it is not surjective because not all of the output values are from an input value. Okay, so there's nothing mapping to this C, so it's not surjective. This is an injective and surjective function, so it's called a bijective or bijection. Um, so each of the values here from the input map uniquely to a value on the output. This function here is surjective, meaning all of the outputs have an input which map to it, but it is not injective because some of the inputs map to the same output. And in this case here, this, is, this holds neither property because there is, uh, it's not injective because two inputs map to the same output and it is not surjective because some of the outputs do not have an input which map to it. So that is what all of those properties mean. Hopefully these diagrams make that a little bit easier for you. So now that we've talked about the properties of a hash function, Let's look at some very simple hash functions. Modulus hashing. So you are probably going to use modulus hashing at some point in your life, if not for assignment two or assignment three, then at some point. And what we do with this, with modulus hashing is we are taking some 
typically large input range of integer values and mapping it to a smaller range of input values. So for example, we would just take an integer x and return x modulus n. And n is the number of bins or the output range size of this hash function. So for example, if we want to take all the values from 1 to 1000 or 0 to 999 and map them into n equals 10, right? Then we would take, okay, all of those values, modulus them by, by 10. So this acts as a sort of truncation. So what do I mean by truncation? So let's say I have the, the number 237. So if I modulus by 10, modulus is essentially integer remainder. So if you do it with 10, which is very convenient because our numbers are written in base 10, you're dividing this number by 10 and then taking the remainder. So if a number is written in base 10 and you, and you modulus it by 10, you're essentially just taking the last digit. So 237 mod 10 would be 7. So let's say we have a, uh, a hash table which has 10 buckets in it. That's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so this 237, whatever that happens to be, we're trying to hash it into this table. So we may modulus it by the size of our table. And then 237 would go into spot seven. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It would live right here. That's modulus hashing. Similarly, we could do binning, which is another type of hashing, where instead of taking a modulus, we are doing integer division. So where modulus is the remainder, integer division is just how many whole times can this number go into this other thing. So, for example, um, if we had, I don't know, uh, 237 again, let's just take that one, and this time we have 10 as our n, so we would divide it by 10, and then we would get 23, okay? Because 10 goes into, tw into this value 23 times. So that is the opposite, uh, kind of the opposite, opposite of modulus, but um, it truncates the lower bits instead of the upper bits. That's, that's one, of the, one of the ways of, of looking at it. So those are just two very, very simple hash functions where you can turn integers into other integers. Let's look now at another type of simple hashing, which, how would we hash a string? For example, how could I turn string data into integer data? So over here, what I have is uh, my name, and this is uh, the associated ASCII integer value. So a C, capital C is 67, lowercase h is 104. This is just straight from the ASCII table. So let's consider me wanting to hash the, the string Churchill into an integer value. Well, one possible way to do that is just character summation. So I'll take the ASCII value for each of those um, characters in my last name, and I'll sum them up. So 926, that would be the sum of Churchill. However, one thing that I might ask you on an exam is what are the properties of the hash function of character summation. Out in the chat, can you tell me if this is injective or surjective? Injective or surjective? Well, pause the video and think about it. All right, so you're finished pausing the video. So what did injective say? Injective said that if all of the input values map uniquely to an output value, right? So, so I've got a couple of answers out there. We're about to discuss what the actual answer is. So think of this as all possible names, okay? Watch this. Let's say I have the name AB. The name AB is going to have some sum S. If I have the name BA, that's going to have the same sum, S, right? So that would be like in this case over here, where two possible names sum to get the same hash value. So it is not injective, not injective. 
Now, is it surjective? Well, if you come up with any possible integer output value, you can pretty easily come up with a input value that creates that integer, right? So for any possible number, yes, there would be, now maybe you're not a, it's not a real English name, or it may be a, thou, a thousand characters long, but I would consider that to be surjective because all of the input integers could possibly have a name that mapped to it, okay? So injective and surjective. What about the distribution, right? Is it, is it normally distributed? Is it equally distributed? What did I talk about distributions here? What did I say? Um, uniformity. Is that uniformly distributed? It turns out that it is not. And the reason it ends up having a normal distribution. I won't get that, won't get into that in too much detail, but it turns out that Because names are essentially, they have, I understand that names don't have random characters in them, but if you think about random character strings, kind of like names, then most of the values are going to be around the middle of the alphabet if you average out all the characters. And because of that, you're going to have a lot more sums of values near the middle of the alphabet. And it turns out that the distribution of this if you take, I don't know, like a thousand random character names that are all 10 characters long, it will actually have a normal distribution and not an even distribution. Is it reversible? Well, we just saw an example of this where if the string AB has some value, right? So this is going to be S and then BA has that same value of S. Then if we ever get a value of S, we could never get back we could never be sure what name produced that value. So it is not reversible because input character order doesn't matter, right? So if I did Churchill or I did Hill Church, right? It's the same, the same uh, summation. So summation is not necessarily a very secure thing to do, but it is one possible very simple hash function. Um, so in order to, for example, solve some of these problems, there are different types of hash functions. One way you can help alleviate some of these problems is instead of just summing uh, individual characters, right? You could take blocks of characters and sum those. So for example, if I took each um, character as four, sorry, each character as a byte, and I took four characters at a time and associated those bytes and then sum the resulting integers, then I would have C-H-U-R, which is this integer, C-H-I-L, which is this integer, and L, which is this integer. So then the hash of Churchill would be this. And then maybe I could modulus that if I want to fit it in some, some hash table. But if I change the uh, H and the C around, and then rehash it, I will have a different hash value. However, if I had chill chur L, it would be the same hash value, right? So this, as we make our hash functions a little bit, a little bit more complex, then we can start to solve some of these problems that we identified here, but we can never solve all of the problems, right? So just realize that there are different ways of hashing strings. And when you get into things like uh, SHA or CRC um, or, or different, like more complex, more secure hash functions, they start to do all sorts of things. Like they take like these three values here and these three values here and XOR them together and then hash those over here. And, and good hashing functions are oftentimes quite complex. And so just keep in mind that we're not gonna go down into the weeds of all those hashing functions. I just, I'm more concerned with you understanding what a hashing function is, what the properties are and what it can be used for. Now let's talk about geometric hashing, which is something you actually might be doing in assignment two. If you want to optimize, you don't have to do this, but you could. So let's say that our assignment has a 2D array, right? So our assignment grid is a 2D array. 
and we want to store our closed list as a one-dimensional array, but we want to associate each bin or each index of that 1D array with a value from a 2D array. So that means we're going to be hashing a two-dimensional XY array index into a one-dimensional array index. So if we have an input of XY, which is a state of our environment, and our output is just an integer, well, let's take the following. Well, let's actually do the example. Do I have this? No, I don't have a diagram of this. So let's do an example of this and then I'll show you the formula. So let's bring up, uh, oops, I thought I had my blackboard ready. Give me one second. All right, so we got the blackboard. Now let's take this as our input grid. We've got this grid behind here and that's really strange. Okay, never mind. Oh, I see why now. I thought there was something written on it already, but there's not. So let me draw a one dimensional array down here. So this is going to be our one dimensional array. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So we've got 12 things down here. And up here, let's say we have a three by uh, a four by three array. So what we're going to want to do is somehow take each of these x, y values. So zero, one, oh, zero, zero. And here we have one, zero. Here we have a uh, two, one, right? So these are the, the locations in our environment. And we would want to come up with a function which maybe maps these values into the index of a one dimensional array. So this one would go here, maybe this one here, this one here, this one here, and then we start at the next row. So this one here, 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 here. So how could we look at that in terms of the actual math of X and Y, right? Well, here we go. So, oops, wrong screen. All right. So let's say we have that input X and Y value and the output an integer. Well, if our hash function f takes in x and y, and we say y times width plus x, this is a minimal perfect hash function. Each x, y is mapped to a single integer i, and then we have, this is actually reversible as well. So let me try and copy and paste this. And this can be used in your A star assignment two, if you want to do a really cool implementation of a, of a um, a closed list, yeah, you could just use a 2D array or you could use a 1D array. So let me go back and I will look at this once more. So here is our minimal perfect hash function right here. So that is the formula. So if we take x, y, so this is 0, 0 up here, right? So let's take 0, 0 and apply this function to it to get an integer. So 0, 0 that's going to be zero times width. So width is four, zero times four plus zero. Well, that's obviously just zero. So this one maps into this one. Now let's take one, zero. So y is zero. Oops, my blackboard uh, has been exposed. So one, zero, that would be zero plus one. So this one would map into this index. Let's take this one right here. So what is this one? This is x index two and y index two. So this one would be two times width. So that's eight plus two, which is 10. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So this one maps into this one. And if I wanted to go backwards from the integer, so let's say zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is index six. How do I get from six back into my X and Y? Well, I can reverse it with this formula. So my Y is going to be six divided by width. So that would be one. So I'm going to be in this row and X modulus width six modulo four is two. So I would be right here. So this would be my value right here. And if I count zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, it works perfectly. So I can get from my input range 
exactly one-to-one -one and onto with my output range, and I can also take the output range value and map it back into my input range, so it's reversible. So that is where I would want to have that sort of property in a hash function. Okay, so that's just, you know, you can use this for you want for your closed list for assignment two. Now, we talked about hash collisions, but let's, let's talk about them in a little bit more detail because this is very important. Hashing data into an integer is typically used to index a hash table, right? And so because we are using actual computers, our array or our table size has to be finite, right? So we might be able to store a million things, maybe a thousand things, maybe just 10 things. But if an array of size n is used, then usually what we're going to do, our hash function is going to translate things into an integer and then modulus n and then stick it into a hash table somewhere. So a hash collision occurs when two different inputs produce the same output, causing a collision inside the hash table. And so injective functions cannot produce a hash collision right? Because they map uniquely. But non-injective functions can produce a hash collision. So over here, we have some examples where we have, um, again, some hash function, we're not going to say which one it is because it doesn't matter, might be able to, might turn John Smith into two, right? Let's say we have an array of size 16 to store our stuff in. We have John Smith that gets mapped into two, Lisa Smith gets mapped into one. Sam Doe gets mapped into four, but uh-oh, Sandra D gets mapped into two. So John Smith and Sandra D are mapped into the same value. Down here, you may say, well, that probably doesn't happen very often. Well, it actually kind of does, especially when we have very, very small table sizes. And if we look here, um, it turns out that even if we just take the 32-bit output of some output of some popular hash functions like CRC32, we can see that the two inputs Plumless and Buckaroo actually produce the same hash output with CRC32. So you'd never use CRC32 these days. It's a very old hash function. It's not very secure. But the question here is: if two values collide, how do we store their values in the hash table? Like what are we going to do here? Maybe we wanted to store their addresses. So if we stored John Smith's address here, and then we wanted to store Sandra D's address, what would we do if we got a hash collision? So there are solutions to this problem, but they're all kind of expensive. Before we get into the solution, let's talk about the probability of a hash collision actually occurring, okay? So have you ever heard of the birthday problem? So the birthday problem is what is the probability if you have n people in a, in a group that two people have the same birthday, okay? So you might think that, well, okay, if we have like 100 people, that there's a one in three chance that two people have the same birthday. Like if you just, if someone gave you one second to think about that problem, if you have 365 days in a year, and you have a hundred people in a room, if you had one second to answer, you'd probably say, okay, there's a one in three chance that two people have the same birthday. But that is not true at all. It is much, 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 much more common. Because we're not asking you, what is the probability that one of those people has this specific birthday, or that one of those people have the same birthday as me, we're asking, what are the chances that any two of those people have the same birthday? And so if we look at this problem mathematically, right, let's say that there are 10 possible birthdays or eight possible birthdays, so I can draw this a little bit easier. So if there are eight possible birthdays and we have four people, for example, well, what are the chances? Well, well, let's just look at how this works. We have well, not four people, but we have some number of people. So we'll take the first person, right? And our first person, maybe their birthday is right here. It's on this day, whatever that day has to be. Now, they had a 0% chance 
of having the same birthday as anyone else up to that point because we've only looked at one person. So now we look at person number two. And person number two's birthday is gonna be one of these things. So what is the probability that the second person's birthday is the same as the people's birthdays that we've looked so far? Well, it's one in eight, right? So it's one in eight. And the reason for that is because we've looked at one person's birthday so far and, and there's eight possible birthdays. So let's just say that person number two's birthday is actually over here, so it wasn't the same. Now we look at the third person's birthday and we say, okay, what is the chance that the third person's birthday now conflicts with one of the other two people? Ah, so now it's actually two out of eight, right? So every time we add a new person, right? If person three's birthday was here, then we look at person four, every single time we add a new person, our chances of colliding with an additional person actually go up. So there's like a quadratic effect here. So let me uh, go back to erase that. So it turns out that this is what the probability looks like. So for example, in our class, we have, I think, 84 people. So if you look at this graph, the probability, so we have 84 people, it's something like 99%. So if we have 84 people in the class, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that two people in the class have the same birthday. Isn't that really fun? Even though we haven't come up with all 365 days, right? There is a 99.9% .9 chance, given that they were all independent, unrelated variables, that two people in the class have the same birthday. So go out there and try and find your birthday buddy. Now, that doesn't say that there's a 99% probability that you have the same birthday as someone else, just that two people have the same birthday. So, the sort of rule that you can use, um, it's not exact, but it's, it's a good rule, is that... Oh, I'll, I'll tell you the rule in a second. But, but in terms of birthdays, since there are 365 days in a year, you have a 53% probability, or sorry, a 50% probability, I cannot read today. So there's a half chance that two people have the same birthday at just 23 people. That's crazy how, how little it is. And so with each new hash, so think of your birthday as your hash, the probability of hitting a new previous hash rises. Okay, and the rule that people sort of use is that you have a 50% probability at approximately the square root of the output range. And so if you have, you might say, okay, I'm using a 32-bit hash number, right? There's 4 billion possible outputs. We're not going to have a collision in 4 billion outputs. Well, it turns out that if you really do have a random uniformly distributed hash function, that you will have a 50% chance of having a hash collision at only 70,000 hashes. And even just 250,000 hashes out of 4 billion, you have a 99% chance of having a hash collision. So hash collisions happen, they happen often, and unless you have a perfect hash function, which guarantees that there are no collisions, then you have to plan for hash collisions. How do we do that? All right, so we're gonna talk about hash tables and how we resolve hash collisions. So hash tables are called, sometimes they're called hash maps or lookup tables. And so it's a data structure that associates some data with values via a key or identifier. So we're gonna have some hash function that goes on our data. For example, our name, John Smith. That's going to produce a key, typically an integer. The hash table, typically implemented as an array, is going to have an index of that key and going to store some value. So for example, take the example of an address book. It's a really good example where you take David Churchill and maybe you wanna store my phone number and my address. And so you have some sort of data structure that you're gonna store in this array that stores an address, stores a phone number. You take my name, translate it into an integer, use that integer as the index of the array, and then you store my data in there. This can be implemented in many, many different ways, but the most common and efficient is to just use an array for the hash table. Um, Python built-in dictionaries 
use hash tables. So if you ever used a, a dictionary in Python, they use hash tables. Um, hash tables also, uh, this is kind of an aside. I actually wanted to remove these slides, but I'll just say it anyway. Hash tables can serve as a cache to save on relatively expensive computations. So this is called memoization in many areas of co uh, computer science and AI. And so we can use hash tables to enable programs to use, to gain additional speed through the use of additional memory. So ideally, hash table query is independent of the number of entries, ideally. And so, I don't know why I have, just ignore this slide. It's in there if you want to look at it. But essentially, if you want, if you're very oftentimes calling a function which has a very uh, computationally intensive process of computing a function, especially recursive functions, then you can use a hash table to store the outputs of those. So if you ever call the output of a function, uh, you call you call a function a second time with the same input, it can just look up the answer instead of doing the expensive computation. So apologies, I didn't mean to have that slide in there. Erase it from your memory. So we're going to implement a hash table as a 1D array, very contiguous in memory, important for cache coherency, all sorts of stuff that we won't be talking about in this course. You can treat each index array as a sort of bucket that holds data. And our job as a hash table implementer is to put things, data, into buckets. So for example, I want to put John Smith's phone number into a bucket in my hash table. I want to put Lisa Smith's phone number into my bucket in a hash table. So when we talk about hash table storage, what values do we actually want to store? Well, for example, for a, a very simple thing like a, um, like an address book, right? Okay, well, we're gonna take our name, we're going to um, hash it as an integer, and then inside the table at that location, we are going to store maybe um, the name, the address, the phone number. If we were doing things like, um, I don't know, if we were doing a hash table to store for assignment two, maybe some heuristic values, we could store heuristic values there right? Anything we wanted to do. So oftentimes we may want to store the original input as a key value pair as well. So for example, in this case of a, um, of a phone book or an address book, we stored John Smith. We hashed John Smith. It goes into 873. So we store John Smith. We store John Smith's phone number. Then later on, we store, we want to store Sandra D. And so Sandra D is going to conflict with John Smith and we can actually look. And since we stored the name John Smith there, we can say, uh oh, Sandra D is not equivalent to John Smith. And so something is wrong here. So sometimes we do want to store um, like the name uh, as well as the phone number. So the stored value depends entirely on the application. Okay. And this is just a, like a really simple example of a hash table that stores addresses and stuff. So again, recall our hash function properties and collisions happen when we have a non-injective function, right? John Smith and Sandra D happen to give the same output value. Okay, load factor for a hash table. The load factor for a hash table is, it's a computed value and it's, it's computed as n divided by k. So n is the number of entries in the hash table and K is the total number of buckets. So if we, for example, have a hash table of size 1000, so K is 1000, and we have 500 entries in the table so far, then 500 divided by 1000 is going to be one half. So our load factor would be one half. If instead we had 2000 things in the hash table, our load factor would be two, right? So typically, the performance of a hash table decreases with load factor due to hash collisions. So finally, we're going to look at hash collisions. <laughs> so if we have a bijective hash function with table size equal to the outputs, equal to the input size, then we would have no collisions, right? So bijective, meaning it's injective and it's surjective, right? So the input maps perfectly to the output, 
and then we had a hash table with the same size as that output, then a bijective hash function would guarantee that we had no collisions. So let me show you an example of that. Here is an example of that. Here we have uh, a function which is bijective. It maps all of the inputs perfectly to the outputs. There are no things left over here and there are no things left over here. And so this is a bijective function and you have an array or table which has the same size output that you had input. So this would have no hash collisions. We can mathematically prove that this scheme that we came up with, no hash collisions would be possible. However, if up here, our input size was bigger than our output size, right? As soon as that happens, then even though we would have a one-to-one -one function, we don't have as many buckets here as we have things that we want to put in those buckets. And so we can't have a, we cannot avoid collisions in that case. So that's the only case where we can completely avoid collisions and it doesn't happen very often in practice because usually the input range of possibilities is far bigger than the table size that we're using to store those things. So a hash collision occurs when the bucket for a new entry is already occupied. So if I, if I go to store something in my hash table, there's something already there, that is a hash collision. So here is a hash collision, when the hash of one input is the same as the hash of another input. So what would we do with the data for Sandra D? What would we do? It's a very important question. And, and this, uh, what we do with it when we have a collision is called hash collision resolution. And the strategy for resolution is what separates most hash table implementations. So you might say, okay, this is a hash table with chaining. So chaining is a hash resolution strategy. So most of the times, if you see different hash tables, they're going to be differentiated by how they handle hash collisions. So the simplest possible solution is that whenever we see a bucket is occupied, we just overwrite it. So uh, sorry, John, but Sandra is here now and we forget, forget all of John's data, right? So here we had John Smith, his phone number might have been here, and then Sandra D, we're going to overwrite with their phone number. Okay, we'll just overwrite it. Sorry, John, that's all you can do. That's the simplest possible thing that you can do. So maybe we have some conditions for storing things in our table. So for example, maybe we want to just store the newest value, right? Maybe we want to store the oldest value. Maybe there's something, you know, maybe we trust the old value more or something. Maybe we want to store the minimum value or the maximum value. Or in terms of AI, maybe we want to store the deepest search result or the shortest path or something like that. But in practice, we don't often just use overwriting because too much data is lost. We lose way too much data. We don't want to overwrite things if possible. So one of the solutions that's most popular is called chaining. And in chaining, Instead of just having an array that stores data, each entry in our array is actually a list. So it's a linked list. Um, doesn't have to be a linked list, it could also be an array, but it's essentially an array of lists. So whenever we insert into the bucket, we simply add it to the end of the list. And so here, when we got to Sandra D, oh look, John Smith is already here, well just insert J Sandra D after John in the list, okay? So if the hash function is uniform, then each list will be small and this will be efficient. In the worst case, we have all of our hash functions colliding and we would essentially just have one big list. But typically our hash function is going to be pretty uniform and so it will be manageable. And so the average query time is going to be the same as the average list size. And we could replace these lists with a set or whatever. However, keep in mind that our hash table can grow beyond the initial array size. So this is one of the downsides of chaining is that you have, yes, you have a number of buckets, but each of those buckets is a list. So even though you just have a hundred buckets, you may have a thousand things in your hash table. So that's just something to consider.
So here's how you would do that. You just have a hash table, which is your array. Each of these things is just a linked list. And hopefully you've done linked lists already in your data structures course, but you would just have a list of items that you store instead of single items. That's one possible way of doing um, chaining in uh, a hash table. So something I may ask in an exam is I'll give you a hash function for a given set of names, ask you to compute the hashes and store them in a hash table of size five with chaining. I might do that on an exam, okay? Open addressing is another, uh, ex is another example of hash collision resolution. So in open addressing, all records are stored in the array. No lists or external data structures are used. So when a new entry is going to be inserted, what you do is the following. First, if there's no collision, easy, just insert it into the index. If there is a collision, you scan forward in the array somehow. So maybe go to the next thing, maybe skip two into the future, however. And then whenever you find an open space, you insert this into the open space. And then you're going to have a secondary key that you use to look things up. So I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. When we look up in an array, we look at the original index. If the second hash matches, then we return. Otherwise, we scan forward until the second key is found. So here's, here's what I mean by that. Um, so this is called open addressing with linear probing. Probing means go to the next thing. Linear probing means you just go one, okay? So if I have already inserted John Smith and now I want to insert Sandra D, what I do is I say, oh, look, there's already an entry here and it has a different second key. So for example, Sandra D, it says John Smith. So I know that this is not the correct place to store this. So what I do is I go to the next one, okay? I just go to the next value and I store it in there. So look at the next bucket. If it's empty, insert it. If it's blocked, go to the next one. So what I mean by, by secondary key is here we are using the name as a secondary key because they both produce a value of 152. So I now need to look at the names to see if they're the same value. However, maybe instead of storing the names as a secondary key, I have a secondary hash value or something. So I have two numbers and it's very unlikely for two different values that two different hash functions would produce the same value. So that's what happens. And when I go to store Ted Baker, for example, well, if Ted Baker was supposed to go at 153, then now I just scan forward and put Ted Baker in 154. So that is, it's open addressing. So it's all stored in the same array. There are no chains. It's linear probing, meaning I go forward by one and see the next thing and it's inserting. Now, if I do the same thing, but I want to look up a value, how do I do that? Well, let's say I want to look up Sandra D, right? So Sandra D, I look at the hash index, take Sandra D, look it up. If the second key matches, I return. So for example, for John Smith, I look up John Smith. Oh, look, it says John Smith. This is the same value, so I return. Otherwise, if it doesn't match, then I go to the next one. And I repeat that process until the second key matches and I see, oh, look, this is Sandra D. So open addressing, linear probing, look up. It's kind of the same thing. You're just returning the value based on the index. One of the problems with this is that linear probing can suffer from clustering. You can see here that I'm going to have a lot of values sort of in the same area, which is bad. And so there'll be a few dense clusters resulting in very, very slow lookups. So other possible strategies are things like um, you could do quadratic probing. So you have some quadratic index. So quadratic just means that, you know, you compute some function to look ahead by, not just going ahead by one. You could have uh, double hashing. So double hashing means instead of going ahead by one, you go ahead by the second hash value, which is also very interesting. Um, and these are just strategies that help to um, avoid entries and clusters in your data structure. 
The last one I'll talk about is called coalesced hashing. And in coalesced hashing, we combine the ideas of chaining and open addressing. However, we do use a chain structure, but the chain doesn't grow the table. It just points to new buckets in the table. So for example, here, instead of computing a secondary hash or just scanning forward, I actually store a pointer to the next thing in memory. Okay, so this typically has better memory performance, but we only can store an amount of things equal to our memory size. So you can just see now, and no, I don't want you to remember every single detail of, of open addressing or, or coalesced hashing and all this. I'm just showing that you, there are many, many different strategies that you can use to resolve hash collisions and they all have different properties and they're all used in, some of them are used in some cases, some of them are used in other cases. But this is what's going on under the hood whenever you use a dictionary, map, that sort of thing. Now, okay, some dictionaries and some maps are ordered sets instead of hash sets, so they operate differently. They're different, okay. Game state hashing. Now let's bring all this back to AI. We oftentimes want to store relevant information about game states. For example, a policy. What move do I want to make? Maybe some value or heuristic. How good a state is? Uh, are we in the closed list or not? So we can store this using a hash table. So some hash tables are trivial where states are simple. So I already looked at this, right? So for example, we already talked about how if I want to have my closed list as a 1D array, then I know exactly now how to translate that state into this index or this state into this index. And not only that, but translate back from this index into this state. Okay, so that's that's a hash table. That, that's what that is, it's a hash table. It's a perfect hash table, so we won't have any collisions, luckily for us. This is also a hash table. We are taking, I talked about this previously, this is a blackjack policy. So the blackjack policy says, okay, uh, you have this in your hand and the dealer has this in their hand. So I'm going to take this value and this value and hash it into an index in this hash table and then store the policy value in the hash table. So that's what they could be used for. However, this again, this is a trivial hash table. This is a trivial hash function. It's a perfect hash function, very easy. This is a perfect hash function. It's not always perfect. So there are games, now this is going to relate to, <sighs> for the rest of this lecture, I'm explaining something that is not going to apply to your assignments unless you want to really optimize the hell out of it, okay? So don't worry too much about this. This is sort of for your own benefit and for your own knowledge rather than something you're gonna have to regurgitate or use on an assignment. How would we, like, okay, this is our environment. We can hash that really easily. But how would we, for example, hash the state of a game of chess? There's pieces all over the board. There's empty pieces, there's queen here, there's a rook there. How could we hash that, for example? So for games with non-tabular structures, how could we compute the index for a state? One way is we could come up with a custom function for each separate game. So I could say, okay, here's my checkers hash function. Here's my go hash function. Here's my chess hash function. Oh my God, that would like for every different game, that would be really, really annoying. It can be super time consuming and we would have to ensure all of the nice properties of that hash function. So we might have to ensure uniformity and determinism and, and all these sorts of things, right? It also might be very expensive to compute. So what I want to show you is something you are not going to be tested on, but is something that I found absolutely fascinating um, the first time I heard about it. And so I want you to, to be fascinated as well, hopefully. I'm really excited whenever I get to show this off to people. So this is called a Zobrist hash function. It is often used in games. So for example, the Zobrist hash function would be able to hash something like, the, like a chess game. It ensures uniformity so it uses randomness to ensure uniformity. It's very, very fast to compute. So you can actually incrementally update the Zobrist hash function. 
meaning that if I want to move, like if I move my pawn one place, I can incrementally update the hash function. So in one calculation, I can update the entire hash function rather than having to loop over the whole board and calculate the whole hash function again. Actions can be reversed in this hash, fun in this hash function, which is awesome. So if I take back a move, or if I'm doing search, I can undo in my hash function. And it relies on two main things. So we're going to create a table of randomized values and an XOR operator. So you may not be familiar with the XOR operator, but the XOR operator has the following property. So XOR is this like little carrot, so shift S, uh, shift six, sorry, that is gonna be the XOR operator. And the XOR operator um, is going to go bitwise on each bit in an integer or whatever data that you have. And it essentially says, if the two bits are different in the two input values, then the output is a one. And if the two bits are the same, the output is a zero. So for example, if I have these two values, A and B, and I want to take the XOR operator on both, what is the result? Well, I go through each of them bit by bit, and I say one XOR zero. So they're different, so the output is a one. Here, the out, they're different, output is a one. Here, they are the same, so the output is a zero. They're the same, so the output is a zero. Uh, they're the same, output is zero, the same, output is zero. So for each bit, one or zero, you check the other number. If it's the same, it's a zero. If it's different, it's a one. There's a really cool property of, um, there are many really cool properties of the XOR operator. One of the properties of the XOR operator that's really interesting is that anything XOR zero is that same thing. So if we have any number and we XOR it with zero, we get the same result back. So A XOR zero is A. Why? Well, because if it was a one, it's going to be a one because zero is zero. And if it's a zero, it's gonna be a zero. So we always get the same output when we XOR something with zero. And XOR is also transitive. <laughs> That means that if A XOR zero is A, then A XOR A, sorry, commutative, commutative, then A XOR A is zero. Why? Because A XOR A, all the things in A are the same as the things in A, and if they're the same, it means it's all zero. So you may think, why does that matter? Well, it will end up mattering, we'll, we'll see. And so A XOR B equals C, some value we had here. A X or A is equal to zero. A X or zero is equal to A. We talked about all these so far. So that means that if we have A X or A, X or B, A X or A is zero and zero X or B is B. See how that works? This is, it's really interesting. And so A X or B is C also means that you can do this in any order. So C X or A is B and C X or B is A. The X or operator is reversible. This is very important. So let's go forward and keep looking. So the Zobrist hash function works like this. We have an initial state hash of zero. So with a blank board with nothing on it, the hash is zero. Next, we are going to generate a random integer for every board position. Okay, so every board position is gonna get a random board integer and that integer value is saved in some table. Then for each position, we have a random integer for each piece possibly being at each position. So we have a randomized, val a randomized table R, which is going to be of size 64, okay, because we have 64 possible locations on a chessboard by 12, because there are 12 different pieces on a chessboard, six different types of pieces, one of each different type of color. So in this table, I have a value, a bunch of different values. It's of size 64 by 12. But at that table R, R 
indexed by the position and a piece, that is the integer value associated with that piece being at that position. So for example, let's say our position is A4, right? So A4 on the chessboard and the piece is black knight. So if R A4 BK is equal to some like random bit string, right? Then that means that if our hash value is equal to this, it means that there is a black knight on position A4 and that is all. Okay, so if we want to put a piece on the board, all we have to do is XOR the state hash by that piece value at that position. And if we want to remove a piece from the board, XOR is reversible. So if I put A4 on the board, right? So let's just do this example here. So I have 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. So if I take H, which is 0, a blank board, and I put, oh, sorry, this is XOR, be a black knight at position A4, then I'm going to XOR this with 0. Sorry, my drawing is terrible. But because I'm XORing it with 0, it's going to be the same thing as itself. So I get 1, 0, Okay, so now I put a piece on the board, I XOR the hash. Now if I want to reverse that XOR, I, if, sorry, if I want to take that piece off the board, then all I have to do is again XOR it with that same value. Because what I do then is I'm XORing it with itself and I get all zeros down here, so I have a blank board again. Isn't that so friggin' cool? <laughs> Like, it's really, really interesting. And the thing is, you just keep XORing the board with more and more pieces. You can put them on, you can take them off, and what you end up with is a randomized integer, which is associated, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an integer associated with that board position. Now, you may recall back that, you know, back at the beginning of the term, at the term, there's something like, I don't know, 10 to the 42 possible chess positions. I think it was something like that. And so if I have an integer hash of eight bits, one byte, right? There are 256 possible chess positions that I could store here, right? So, okay, this is not a great hash function because I only have one byte storing. But if I have 64 bytes or 64 bits right here then that's two to the 64 that's a lot more values so yes there are more possible chess boards than there are places to store this this hash right the the input is bigger than the output however if i make h like 64 or 128 bit then it ends up being very unlikely that any two chess positions, two, two different chess positions might actually store the same hash value, okay? So I know that was a little bit to take in. If you're interested, study that a little bit more because it's really, really cool. And now I want to blow your mind for a second time because this absolutely blew my mind and really shows the power of XOR. So. I'm going to show you, essentially, at a, at a very high level, how something like data recovery and disk recovery works using disk redundancy in something like a RAID drive array. So no, this is not exactly how it works. There's much more going on behind the scenes, much, much, much more going on behind the scenes. But let me show you the abstract concept that is happening. Okay, let's say that we have four disks of data, right? So I have four terabyte hard disks, disks of data. And I have this, I have data written to those. So this is the data on disk number one. Obviously this is only eight bits so, or seven bits. So it's, it's not, you know, I can't draw a terabyte here, but this is a full hard drive. This is another full hard drive. This is another full hard drive. And I want to make sure, what I want to do is somehow come up with a scheme so that if one of my drives dies, I want to be able to get my data back. 
but I don't want to have to have a duplicate of all of my data. Okay, so yes, one way of doing this is if I have four drives, I could get another four drives and copy all of my data to those four drives, right? Of course, but it turns out that I can do it so that if I can make all of my data recoverable, no matter which disk dies, as long as it's a single disk, by having one XOR disk. So watch this. Let me introduce one disk, and it doesn't matter if I have four disks here or a thousand disks here. I'm going to take the XOR of all the values from all of my disks and store the result over here. Okay? So just watch. I'm going to store in, okay, one XOR zero is one, XOR one is one, and over here, actually this is a parity disk. So we're essentially counting an even or odd number of ones. Okay, I'm calling it an XOR disk, but it's a parity disk. So if I have an, uh, an even number of ones, I store a zero. If I have an odd number of ones, I store a one. Okay, that's essentially what this is doing here. So that's what I did here. I stored this data. And for each of these rows, for each disk, I have an XOR disk. Now, let's pretend that disk number two dies, right? Disk number two is now dead. Uh-oh, all my data is gone. It could have been disk number three, could have been disk number four, it just happened to be this one. Watch this. If I do that same parity or XOR check, right? Look, okay, so let's take, now I have this data over in my XOR disk, I'm gonna do the same thing that I just did. So, I'm gonna do the parity check. So there's an even number of ones in this row. So I'm gonna put a zero here. There's an odd number here. So I'm gonna put a one here. That's essentially the XOR thing. And then I'll do that. And all of my data is now recovered. Just by having one disk. So I can make it so that if I have any amount of disks, right? I introduce one redundancy disk and no matter which disk dies, I can get the data back from the dead disk just with this. So technically we recover from drive to failure if we XOR the columns as well, exactly. But it could be any disk, right? Not just XOR. There we go. So some people, some data, like some RAID arrays will do something like this. Some RAID arrays will have like two, three drive redundancy, and it's just more complex versions of this with all sorts of data checks and, and other things. But I just wanted to show you like how powerful this is. The fact that XOR is reversible, which essentially means the parity is reversible, right? So you have this parity disk, you store it, and now you can recover your data. So I thought that was pretty cool the first time I saw it. So that's it. That is hash functions. That is hash tables. That is XOR. That is state hashing. Um, there you go. Some, someone asked, would this work with more than one dead disk? Uh, if you have a single parity drive, no, it won't. There are other schemes to recover from more than one dead disk. I'm going to let you think about that one because this is not a data management course and I'm already gone over time. So thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Thanks for the questions and uh, I'll see you in the next lecture.